Trigger Warning This podcast addresses deeply rooted and challenging topics. It is written for open-minded individuals who are seeking insight and alternative perspectives on the complex histories of cults and their leaders. Many cults are destructive, and some of the content presented here may be emotionally triggering. This podcast is not recommended for young people, as some content may be inappropriate. Listener discretion advised. Welcome to Cult Following. Daniel Perez led a cult that lived at Angel's Landing, a 20-acre property in a rural area north of Wichita. He convinced his communal family that he had magical powers, including the ability to see the future. He told them he was a centuries-old angel who needed to have sex with young girls to stay alive. This is the Cult of Angels Landing on today's Cult Following. Hi, Lisa. We're back. Hey, Todd. I'm excited to be here. Well, it's just the two of us today. We don't have Dr. Katie. She's off doing her doctor stuff, but I don't think we really need her today because this particular cult leans a little more toward true crime. So I think we can do it. I think we got it. And I think you might secretly be a true crime fan. Are you? Uh, I am a little bit of a true crime fan. I think this one that we're going to talk about today is pretty, it's pretty dark. Do you watch true crime Netflix shows and stuff or listen to podcasts? I know a lot of people like to do that. Yeah, sometimes I do. I find it fascinating. Um, Maybe I just kind of want to know what's going through their mind, what makes them do what they do. Exactly, which is kind of the root of this show is what makes people do what they do. And, uh, and I think people, listeners today, will, will definitely hear the cult aspect of this, um, but they'll also hear the true crime part of it. This is just, it's truly shocking and frightening that people fall for stuff like what Daniel Perez did. But let's, uh, let's jump into it. You have a little bit of back information about the cult of Angels Landing. Why don't you give that to us? So Angels Landing was the location where Daniel Perez's cult was housed. Perez, also known by the name Lou Castro and many other names, convinced his followers that he had magical powers. He was a man with a shadowy past who somehow convinced a number of people that he was an angel who was hundreds of years old, could heal the sick, and see into the future. He also told members that he needed to have sex with children or he would die. There at Angel's Landing, he would murder at least one of his followers and repeatedly rape children on his commune. Oh, that's a dastardly. (laughs) Super dark opening. I know, right? So, you know, there's there's a little bit there to unpack, I think, right out of the gate. You know, obviously he couldn't see the future or he would see his prison sentence. (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly. I think, Uh, have you ever met someone that just gives you chills? Like everything in your body is telling you to go the other direction? Because that's kind of what I'm imagining when I think about what it would be like to meet this guy. Well, you would think, right? But apparently people fell for this. You know, I actually, I think it's interesting you mentioned this because I have, I'm going to bring this up a little later in our, in our, uh, in our episode here. But yeah, I, I wonder how people can fall for this. You know, I, you know, you always hear stories about people like Charles Manson were like incredibly charming. You mm-hmm. know, most people just see how Charles Manson looked. You see him in the bell bottom, you see him in the long hair, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't know if people like him because he looks hippie ish or, you know, people falling for the long hair thing or whether he truly was charming, but almost all the people that were kind of in his core group all said the same thing, how charming he was. But for most of the public, they just saw the, just the warped out of his mind, crazy man that was incarcerated, you know, but there must've been a different version of Charles Manson to bring people on for what he did. And people have to remember it with Charles Manson, Charles Manson didn't actually murder anyone. He went to prison for his entire life. All he did was tell people to murder people. He never actually hurt anyone. So it's very odd that he had that kind of power to not not only create this group around him, but then also convince them to commit murder. So, you know, even even after he was in jail, he had women throwing themselves at him. 
Mm -hmm. throwing themselves and writing letters and coming to visit. It's just insane. That was the last thing I would ever want is to go visit somebody. Unless I was doing an interview. (laughs) Yeah. But that did that to people. It's, it's a syndrome for sure. I've, I've heard about that. Women who fall for men in prison is very common thing. Very weird. I think, I think that's a very special level of desperation. Maybe. Go, go looking for your men in prison. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a little bit to add to this. So Lou Castro, um, he managed to convince a whole slew of followers that as an angel, he could tell you exactly when you were going to die. Now, of course, the challenge with that kind of prediction is that it can, you know, pretty easily be proven wrong if that particular date comes and goes. So Lou solved that problem the way most psychopaths would by occasionally killing his followers. (laughs) So awful, right? But the kicker was that Lou would convince his followers to take out huge life insurance policies and the money would go to him. So each time someone accidentally died on his compound, Lou got more believable and he got more rich. What do you think about that? Premeditated, probably, these crimes, it certainly seems like. It's it's definitely premeditated, but it makes me wonder if they knew. Hmm. You know, if, if he's asking everybody to take out a life insurance policy and then they die... I don't know. I you think know, I would be. I, I would definitely panic if he was like, "Hey, Lisa, uh, I need you to go take out a huge life insurance policy." Right, right. Um, you know, of course, I have an insurance policy on you, Lisa, in case anything happens to you and I can't continue the <laughs> podcast. So, you know, if you were to get hit by a bus and I lost my co-host, you know, at least I would get paid, right? Right. <laughs> Simply, that's business. not terrifying no, at all. No, that's not. <laughs> um. You know, uh, I, there's not a lot known about how this kind of this commune worked, whether this guy just had some property and some buildings, whether there was any religious aspect to this. Not a lot is really known about this Angels Landing cult, even though it's actually kind of recent history that all this went down. Um, so I think it's hard to say whether, you know, this was something that looked more religious in a way, because I've seen, you know, we've talked about this in previous episodes Uh, Just us being from the Midwest, we've seen local churches like all over the pole barn churches. You know, there's a small town in Indiana where I'm from that you're near that actually is the headquarters, international headquarters of three major cult churches. And not only that, but there's every denomination of everything throughout the Bible Belt here. So I've certainly seen these types of churches ask for gifts from their parishioners. And these gifts have been things like weapons. They've been deeds to homes, gifting cars to the church. This is a normal, normal thing. So asking these people to have a life insurance policy might not have been looked at as, as much of anything to them. Not I'm trying to defend lose actions, but I've seen this happen even in organized church situations. Do you, can you see that at all happening? I mean, Maybe if you were completely blinded by the ideal that this was actually an angel, but somebody asking me to donate weapons or a life insurance policy, for me, I think that would just be major red flags. Sure. Yeah. You have a little bit of data about um, his sex offender registry listing. Why Why don't you tell us about that? So the Kansas City Bureau of Investigation's sex offender registry shows the girls were victims of his numerous child sex crimes ranged in age from 8 to 16. His sex sex offender registry indicates that he began abusing children in 2001, and the abuse spanned more than a decade, ending in 2015. Hmm. So, you know, whatever this guy has going, he's obviously targeting the adults of his commune because we, we see that, you know, he's convinced them he's supernatural. They're writing these life insurance policies to him and then victimizing the children is a whole different kind of level of evil, I think. So I, I think my first question I would pose to you, Lisa, is what kind of parent would allow their children around someone who claimed they needed to have sex with children? Because this guy has stated this to everyone, told everyone that they all knew it. Like, where do you go from there? 
I don't know. That's really hard for me to wrap my head around. I there's no reason for for a male to even be around. I don't have kids, but even my nieces and nephews, like you have no business even being around them when you're alone. There's no way. I don't if if I think he said that he needed it or he would die, then unfortunately, you know, sorry. I I, I can't help I'd you. I'd like to think, you know, this is Kansas, right? I've driven through Kansas. I hate Kansas. <laughs> it, and, you know, a lot of farm in Kansas. It's really a miserable drive through Kansas. I, if there's any listeners from Kansas, I apologize. But, I mean, come on. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know they're probably so – our Kansas listener, listener, whoever you are, probably hates driving through Indiana. <laughs> yeah. That's probably true. But, uh, but I've been driven through Kansas from east to west. Miserable, terrible drive to go through it. I'd like to think that – this is some way out there community that just maybe didn't have the smartest people, you know, that you're really out there in the sticks. Right. But and Wichita is where all this went down. This is really near Wichita, which is a fairly major city in the state. And it's, so it's hard for me to believe that maybe these people were just s- stupid that followed yeah. this person. So, I mean, uh, yeah, in general, it seems like they start off asking for smaller things when they bring you in. So I wonder what happened before this. Like, what was the lead up? Or did he just come out in the very beginning and was like, I need access to your children? Because that's a pretty sure. big leap, I feel like, to be made. There's not a lot of data about the the people that survived this. And there's even less about the children that suffered this. So it's been hard for me to get any additional information to really understand this. So I, I'm wondering if the kids were brought up thinking that Lou Castro was an angel, if that's maybe how they bought into that. And there's certainly a different kind of, you know, sexual abuse, I suppose I would say to an eight year old than a 16 year old. And I would wonder, you know, and maybe this is a good question for you to answer is how would a 16 year old look at that? You know, how you would think a 16 year old is practically an adult. How would a girl be swayed? to, you know, to maybe fall for this, or, um, I'm not even sure the words I want to use to describe this, but it doesn't sound like these were like, uh, you know, violent assaults necessarily. At least that's not what was. I, I can't y- imagine that any of the children would have really been willing. Hmm. I feel like, you know, your parents are supposed to be the people that, that, protect you and that love you more than anybody in the world. And if they're telling you, Hey, you need to do this or go here. Um, I don't know. I feel like maybe if you're young enough, you'd be inclined to believe them because they're your parents. But at 16, I don't know. I would think, I don't know. I would, you, know, you would want to think that they would try to fight them off, but maybe it, if they were brought up in it. You know, I'm looking now I'm skipping ahead and I'm looking at kind of his charges and he did have, several of his accounts were aggravated criminal sodomy and aggravated assault. So apparently there were fairly violent assaults Encounters. on yeah. people. So, you know, um, y- yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just say, I also wonder like the numbers that we have, this is just the abuse that we know about. Yeah. This is just what's essentially documented, but I wonder how many more children were his victim that we don't even know about because a lot of times when you go through something like this, you don't really want to speak up or tell anyone because you're scared or even ashamed. For sure. For sure. The prosecutor said his goal was to use life insurance proceeds from the deaths of his followers to live a lavish lifestyle. In his greed, he killed 26-year-old Patricia Hughes, also known as Victoria Hughes, by the way, a wife and mother. Her 2003 drowning death in a swimming pool was first classified as accidental, but the truth came out years later when one of the girls he had convinced a lie for him went back to police. And that girl told investigators that she was 11 years old when Perez told her to lie to the police And she said that Hughes had fallen and drowned in in the pool. The girl said in truth to the police that she heard a splash and a scream. Then she saw Perez wet and out of breath. So he was up to no good, clearly (laughs) making the kids lie, murdering this poor woman. But that's not the only death, right? Lisa, you have some other, some other information. 
There were six purported accidental deaths over seven years that led to millions of dollars in life insurance payouts. The life insurance insurance payout for Hughes' death alone exceeded $1 million. Wow. <laughs> so it says almost, you know, six and seven years. That's almost one a year. Yeah. That's pretty frequent. He had a racket and maybe planned it meticulously because, um, you know, maybe one a year might not, you know, maybe be overlooked, right? Well, I, I read something um, online where it said that one of the Sedwick County sheriffs, Detective Goodwin, was quoted saying that about every two and a half years, bank account balances would get low in the makeshift family and then someone would die. Mm. So it seemed like there's a pretty direct correlation between low on cash and another, quote, accidental death. It speaks to the power that a person can have over a community. Um, I, You know, his mugshot in his press photos, he wasn't a particularly attractive man. No. So he had to have some type of power over these people. I don't know what that was, but he certainly, you know. I think uh, his his eyes in particular look terrifying. Oh, yeah. Crazy person eyes, right? Yeah. (laughs) Tell me a little bit more about some of the other horrors that were in store for uh, Perez's followers. So a few more of the horrors that were in store for the followers of Perez. (laughs) In 2001, there was a plane crash that killed a group member, her boyfriend, and her 12-year-old daughter. In 2006, Patricia Hughes' husband, Brian Hughes, was killed when a carjack failed and he was crushed. And he left the care of his daughter to another group member who then died in a traffic accident in 2008. So wow. it seems like anybody that was involved with this cult had an increased probability of a accidental death. Wow. Wow. You know, what's interesting is that, uh, you, you know, he ultimately will go to prison um, mainly for his first degree murder of Patricia Hughes. The rest of these things weren't really put on him. Whether he had some involvement in it, what the cause of these crashes were, maybe he manipulated the plane, maybe he manipulated the car, whatever happened, maybe he was involved. No one really knows or is talking about that, or there was really no evidence to support it when there's none of that information is available. But apparently, you know, they they didn't go after him for it. But I'm interested in, you know, I, you know, me, I always kind of like, try to think of the weird supernatural element to this is, you know, could this just be bad luck? Could this have been orchestrated? And, and I felt like you and I could engage in a conversation on bad luck and karma. And I'm curious if you personally, Lisa, believe in that kind of thing. Do you believe in bad luck or, or karma? Um, I think I believe in karma. I think what you, you get, what you give. And may, I mean, I could, s- I don't say I necessarily feel that for this. I mean, in the plane crash, the 12 year old daughter died. I don't think that, I mean, that's just tragic. Um, If you're next to something dark, it, you might get that, you know, when people start worshiping false idols, bad things can happen to you, you know? So I, I think that's where I go with this is you're in a commune. You're worshiping this guy that claims, you know, he's an angel and needs to, you know, eat babies and rape young girls and all of this, you know, when you go to the dark side like that, maybe bad things will happen to you. And I I think it's uh, interesting because it's not just one person with another freak accident after a bunch of staged accidents, you know? Yeah. Uh, So I I, I often wonder if, uh, you know, that's going to happen. A lot of people dabble in witchcraft, bad things happen to them. You know, it's well, against God. I mean, definitely. I wonder, you know, it said that girl came back that was 11 when Perez told her to lie to the police. And later she decided to go back to the police and tell him the truth. I wonder if anybody else will eventually come forward and provide more insight to some of these other freak accidents. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm very interested. You know, this is probably one of those things where we'll probably pick up more information as, as you know, the years go on and maybe we'll have an update to this at the beginning of a future uh, podcast. But, um, but it's certainly uh, a, a fascinating one 
how this could all happen in this small community in Kansas. Um, I want to tell everyone a little bit about what wound up happening to this guy. Perez was found guilty on 28 charges. There was one count of first degree murder, eight counts of rape, seven counts of aggravated criminal sodomy, three counts of aggravated assault, um, one count of sexual exploitation of a child and eight counts of making false information. Perez was handed two life sentences plus 406 months with no possibility of parole for 80 years. The judge said the evidence conclusively shows that Mr. Perez used people as mere objects to fulfill his desire for money, sex, and a lavish lifestyle. It is just that he serves the maximum sentence. Final thoughts on this? (laughs) Well, that kind of bothers me. I mean, someone who's accused and found guilty of all of these atrocities should not ever be given the chance at parole, even if it's after 80 years. He'll be long dead. I mean, yeah, but uh, I don't know. I don't even think that there should be that option. And I'm not even sure this guy deserves, like, the luxury of prison. Like, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, essentially, we're going to be paying for his health care and three meals a day and TV time and just footing the bill yeah. for the rest of his you, life. You don't have a problem with death penalty. Um, not when it's clear cut like this. Hmm. I know there's a lot of people that have been wrongfully convicted and, you know, DNA and stuff has helped to free them. And so uh, there's a lot of times I would not I would say that's not OK. But in this case, Yeah. I feel like that's a waste of taxpayers' money. Yeah. Yeah, you might be right. And there's a few people that once they go to jail, they meet wives and, you know, get conjugal visits and have kids. And I'm not sure this is somebody that needs to be procreating either. He also might be getting raped and sodomized in prison. That's probably true. He might have a lot of karma coming back for him. (laughs) He might. (laughs) They they tend to not be very nice to people that... That, that, uh, to that mess with kids. Yeah. 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 Because the prison guards have a way to leak that to everyone, you know, yeah. and you get your, your, your brains beat in. Yeah. So his karma might come back for him. All this was relative, you know, in the early two thousands that all this stuff happened. So it's a relatively newer case, but an obscure one. And it was a nice one to cover today to uh, see what that was about. I'm anxious to find out more data about all this. And I'm always curious just psychologically how people fall for these types of things. And, and I think it's, it's always this, this season we have interviews for the, for the first time cult following will be interviewing people um, on the shows, but you know, people are reluctant to come forward when they've been duped is the problem, you know? Yeah. So uh, that one day you believed in someone who said they were an angel and then, you find out that you could have possibly been murdered. Um, people, sometimes people don't come forward to talk about that because they're embarrassed. And you see that a lot with cults. Yeah. Um, you know, Nexium is one of the, the cults we'll be covering this year. There were thousands of people that went through Nexium, but you only hear about a dozen of these people in the media, the ones yeah. that are the most outspoken. No one else wants to come forward and talk about it. And there are actually a lot of people that had good experiences there that learned the technology they wanted to learn and it made their lives better. And they moved on. They took a class and moved on. Yeah. That could have happened at Scientology. That could have happened at landmark. It could have happened in any other places where they just took a course, made their lives and got out, you know, and that's what they did. Right. And I wouldn't even say got out, just, you know, took the course and went on, you know, getting out is like paper knowingly learn something (laughs) and you, you move on, you know? Yeah. You know, People went to vacation Bible school. You went in, you got out, you know, (laughs) I went to vacation Bible school and, uh, literally the day it it was at a Baptist church. And, um, even though I was Catholic, I was, we had to go to this vacation Bible school that was at a Baptist church. And, uh, the day after I left it, it burned down. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Burned down. It was an old wooden church, old wooden like rectory attached to it, all the stuff. And yeah, it literally burned down. So that's always been a joke ever since it. <laughs> Todd goes to vacation Bible school and it burns down. <laughs> that's terrible. Uh, well, anyways, um, Lisa, it's our first one working together, just me and you. I think it went well. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. We'll do this again sometime if uh, 
Dr. Katie can't make it. Yeah, that sounds good. I know she's really busy, so it's nice that we can explore some of these on our own. Yeah, we'll get some of these that don't need a... I don't think we need a psychiatrist or psychologist today to say that this guy was batshit crazy, right? Yeah. (laughs) Well, why don't you take us out with your closing? She's got to look for it, folks. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you for listening, everyone. Be sure to rate and review this episode. You can find us on Facebook at Cult Cult Following Podcast and on Instagram at Join the Cult Following. If you have questions or comments for us, you can send them to jointhecultfollowing at gmail.com. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll see you next time, okay? Have a good evening. (laughs) Okay. Metacortex Publishing hopes that you've enjoyed this presentation. Please take a moment to listen to some other podcast offerings from Metacortex Publishing. A quest is a search for something. And every week, the Quest podcast will show you how we know what we know through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. I'm your host, Todd Fisher. Join me in this thought-provoking and inspiring podcast of discovery. Find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Father Daniel DePlantis, a Catholic priest, martial artist, and host of the Karate Priest Podcast. Have you ever wondered what the church teaches about different topics? Are you a martial arts enthusiast or just someone who wants to learn more about martial arts? I'd like to invite you to join me and many guests on my podcast as we cover topics of faith, everyday living, and martial arts on the Karate Priest Podcast. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.